Well, I, uh, there are times dealing with these, this age of people, like the, the, the uh, young college students, when I'll go up to one of them and I'm giving them what I consider just to be an energetic, like, greeting. And I may see them and I may go, hey, what do you say? And I've noticed with some of them, they go, what? What? And I'm going, no, no, I just, or, or I'll say, hey, what do you say? And they'll go, what did I say? And I'm, no, no, right? And, and, and I'm realizing, you know, for me growing up, that was something I would, we would just say, hey, what do you say, man? You didn't expect an answer. You just, it was just, it was like saying, how you doing? What's happening? You don't really expect someone to, to, to necessarily, you know, respond. And the, but the reality was what? I was giving, I'm giving a greeting. Hey, what do you say? But understandably, they're hearing a question. Hey, what do you say? And I, 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 I don't know. What am I supposed to be saying? What, what is it you wanted me to say? I didn't think I said anything, right? And I understand that. And I realized that it may, you know, be, you know, generational or depending on whether their fa parents use the phrase or whatnot. I made it the title of my sermon today, but not the way I typically use it. I, 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 I'm not using it as if Jesus is walking through the crowd, as we saw last week, performing miracles, touching lives. Hey, what do you say? Hey, what do you say? Yeah. Hey, how's it going? You know, like that's not how I'm using it, right? I'm actually using it in the way that it's perceived as a question. It's a question to get our attention to this passage in Matthew chapter 9 and into chapter 10 that Jesus wants us to be saying something. And that something is about him. And so let's ask him to help us to see that. Father in heaven, we thank you for your living word. I believe with all my heart, almighty God, that the creation around me is an absolute evidence that you are the great creator. I believe with all my heart, the evidence of scripture and of testimony through the centuries that Jesus Christ, God the Son, came to this earth to be our savior. I believe with all my heart that this Bible that we're reading, Lord God, is direct revelation that, Holy Spirit, you breathed through the personalities and pens of these authors. So we ask you, O living God, move among us today. Stir us, we pray. Come, Holy Spirit, revive your church today. That's our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, Matthew chapter 9, we kind of ended with verse 33 last week, and it's the last of the four miracles, and we pick up there with this statement, and the crowds were amazed. And they were saying, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. Verse 34, but the Pharisees were saying, he casts out the demons by the ruler of the demons. Satan, Beelzebul. Jesus was going through all their cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the, labor, the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. And then in the chapter 10, Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Now the name of the 12 apostles are these, the first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. And these 12 Jesus sent out after instructing them, do not go in the way of the Gentiles and do not any, enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The first thing I want us to kind of recognize here, because we're asking, hey, what do you say? Is the testimony of the Pharisees, what they were saying. Hey, what do you say, Pharisees? Here's what we say. And we see it there, and it comes in the context of the crowds being stunned and saying, 
the miracles of Jesus, they're, they're overwhelming. They're, they're, they're messianic. They're pointing us to who he must be. And the enemies of Jesus know what everyone has seen. They can't debate the obvious. The blind men are seeing. The mute man is talking. They can't debate the obvious. But they have a position on it, right? 20 years ago, I remember uh, President Bill Clinton was the president, and I remember reading an article on a particular day about this piece of legislation that he had initiated and that I think uh, you know, cooperated with the Republican Congress, and it was a very beneficial piece of legislation to uh, strengthen and protect religious freedom in our country. It was beneficial to churches, uh, synagogues, in, in the freedoms that they had. And uh, it wasn't, I wasn't here with somebody in our church, so don't be looking around, right? But I was with a, a group of Christians in another context, and one of them was making it very clear that President Bill Clinton has never done anything good in his entire tenure. And I said, well, you know, sometimes we've got to be careful when we're talking about presidents. You may not like them or whatever. But, but you know, the, 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 he's done some good things, right? Whether you're opposed to him or not. And, well, name one. And I said, well, I just read an article today about this particular thing. You know, it was so obvious to me. And, but the person went on to kind of say, ah, I'm sure that he didn't have anything to do with that. And I said, no, actually he did. It, it say, you know, state this here. And I'm not here today shaping a sermon to, you know, uh, to rewrite whatever the history of Bill Clinton as president of the United States or whatever. I'm making the point of what happens to give you a picture of where are the Pharisees. That when, it may be true, but I've got to find a way to make that somehow be negative. And we know it didn't stop there. We live today. We're well aware of what the venom in our political climate, and, and it doesn't matter, you know, you know who, there's just, there's a lot of venom of how can we attack whatever was done. Well, that's the Pharisees, and I can't, I, I, I use politics because that's, to me, it's part of what, what we almost have, we taste in our country of what, it was religious, but it was this Venom that was set against Jesus. And they're looking at these events and saying, all right, how do we deal with what we see? How do we take charge of this and turn it? And so they do that. They take control of the story and they spin it against Jesus. Look at what they say. The Pharisees were saying, he casts out the demons by the ruler of the demons. Jim Gaffigan is a comedian, and uh, one of his shows that I've seen, you know, on video, I, but I, I, I don't know where, like it was live, but he begins the show, and no doubt, the way he did a lot of shows, he begins the show kind of saying, uh, uh, well, I do want everyone here to feel comfortable, and that's why I'd like to talk to you about Jesus. Now, he's not a Christian comedian. He's talking to an audience in Atlantic City or, or Kansas City or whatever. And so he says, I'd like to, I want you to feel comfortable. And so I'd like to talk to you about Jesus. And everybody laughs. Understandably, they laugh, right? They laugh because they realize that's, that's not what we thought you were going to say in a public secular crowd was going to make us feel comfortable. And then he uses another voice and he kind of uh, says, he'd better not, right? And he says, you know, sometimes when people come up to me and say, I'd like to tell you about Jesus, I say to them, I'd rather you not, right? And you know, I, I'm, I don't, I'm, not, so I'm not offended by that. I'm not offended that that's... His humor, because what is it? His humor is pointing to what? It's pointing to reality. That when you talk about Jesus, there's a varied response. And from some people, it may be, oh, my Jesus. For other people, it may be, ah. For other people, it may be quite hostile. Right? Don't be shocked when someone who hates the message of Jesus says something terrible about Jesus. I shouldn't say, why would I be surprised? If you hate the message of Jesus, why would it shock me if you profane his name or if you just seek to you know, disparage and mock him? That's not shocking to me. And it's not shocking 
knowing that the Pharisees are already that kind of religious political group that are saying it doesn't matter. So he gave sight to the blind. We got to be able to find something negative in that. That's, that's, that, that, that's, that's their position. What's shocking? What's shocking is how far they go with it. The Pharisees say that Jesus is demon controlled. Jesus. He's doing this by the power of Satan. By Satan's power, he's casting out demons. This man is demonic. He's under the control of Satan. Listen, there may be many times in our lives where we feel slandered, we feel misrepresented, we feel wrongly accused. You have never had an injustice spoken against you that comes anywhere close to this injustice. You just haven't. And we, nev we never will. There has never been a greater verbal injustice. There has never been a more perverted testimony than what we read in verse 34. For Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, has invaded Satan's domain. And he is setting people free from the stranglehold of sin and Satan. It's giving them freedom and new life and forgiveness. And what are they saying? Yeah, you see Satan at work there? Stunning. We may say, how is that possible? <laughs> right? How is it possible? Right? How is it possible to see that kind of power in Jesus and not believe? You know, what is the barrier? I was reading an article this week about sunscreens. You know, they're all SPF this or SPF that. And um, it stands for sun protection factor. And it can be quite confusing. The article was fascinating because it says, you may think that SPF 100 gives you double the protection of SPF 50. But really, SPF SPF 50 blocks 98% of the UBV rays and SPF 100 blocks 99% of the you know UVB rays neither of them blocks the UVA rays right you know kind of but but you like as you're, as you're reading it and going okay wait really only 1% difference now what, what, how do we come up with the numbers I'm trusting the article was true, right? And uh, but 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 you know, when you think about that, what kind of SPF are the Pharisees wearing? In this sense, it'll be spiritual prevention factor, right? How much spiritual prevention factor do they have on? The Apostle Paul answers that for us. You hold your place in Matthew and you just look at 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and you realize uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, who's actually applying this to them? It's the very one that they're saying Jesus is representing. For in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, after Acts and Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3, the Apostle Paul says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world, that's Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. What kind of SPF are they wearing? That. Satan's blinding power that somehow Jesus gives sight to the blind. And what they're saying is, it must have been Satan that gave him the power to do that. That's the testimony of the Pharisees. See, secondly here, the testimony of Jesus. What is Jesus saying back in Matthew chapter Nine in those last verses. What I love about Jesus is Jesus does not let the trash talking of the Pharisees affect him in any way. Isn't it fascinating to just read there? The Pharisees were saying he cast out the demons by the ruler of the demons. You picture that? That they're talking about me and not Jesus? And I'm going along, hey, yeah, you think Pastor Vince is being used of God? He's being used of Satan. What? 
what are you saying about me, right? <laughs> like the, the way, she, what do we read in these verses? He cast out the demons by the ruler of demons. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages. And no response, right? No response to what they're saying about him at all. Oh, he talks about them later. He'll deal with the Pharisees at different times. He'll tell them later, yeah, that uh, doesn't make any sense that, I would, that Satan would destroy his own kingdom, right? But, but here, we, no response. He's not focused on what they're saying about him. He's not consumed with those who hate him. He's consumed with those that he loves. Whew. What a powerful picture that Jesus gives us. What a testimony. He remains on his mission. His attention is on those who need him. His compassion is on a hurting world. Verse 35, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness and seeing the people. Jesus, did you see what the Pharisees said about you? I see the people. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. When our focus is on how we are being mistreated, see, it may not be the crowds, any relationship. It may be in my marriage. It may be in my ministry. When my focus is on how I'm being mistreated, the posture of my heart changes and it becomes what? Right? Defensive. You know, whatever you're, you know, karate kid, whatever, you know, it's, it's you start to get into whatever your position, it, the posture of our heart begins to become defensive because we have put our eyes on Satan's efforts at mistreatment. And we go into shutdown mode and our compassion for others gets dramatically affected. I don't know much about what's going on in the boxing world today. We've talked about boxing before, Bob, like just what you And I remember as a kid, you knew who the names were in Rocky Marciano and, and Sonny Liston, the, the, the legendary names. But when I was a kid, Frazier and Ali, Frazier and Ali. We were, Frazier was Philly. We were a Frazier home, you know, but Frazier and Ali, right? And George Foreman in there. And then I remember getting into some of the, you know, you know Mike Tyson. I, I, I went and got a soda and the fight was over as he's knocking people out in a minute. And, and then eventually he bit Evander Holyfield's ear. And, and kind of that's, that was the last one I really remembered watching, right? I I like the Olympic boxing and Sugar Ray Leonard and all those guys. But I was reading a, a, a something this week on the internet and it sent me to a story. So some of you boxing people that, that really get into kind of that real boxing, like not just the, 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 the main stories, but it was about a boxer named Anthony Hembrick. It was in a boxing match in 1990. I remember, I, I, I kind of, when I read the date on it, I said, oh, Deanna was two weeks old, and my daughter Deanna, she was two weeks old, and so it made me, you know, kind of know, I remember the time, but it was the USBA light heavyweight title, and Anthony Hembrick was a promising light heavyweight fighter. He was an army sergeant, he had been on the 1988 USA Olympic team, and at this point he was 14-0, and 0, and he was heavily favored against Booker T. Word, and if you want to Google this later, you can watch, watch it, but anyhow, he came out onto the ring, and I guess he had watched his fair share of the Rocky movie or whatever in Apollo Creed. And when he came out onto the ring, first he started in his corner. And five of his corner guys came onto the ring all in matching outfits. And then he started doing his, you know, he's doing his little, and they're trying to lasso his feet. And he's doing, showing his footwork and, you know, and all his, and then he turns to another guy. And they start going, you know, doing these moves and bumping and, and spinning and, and the center of the ring. And, and, it was, it was, and as he's doing it, it's on TV. Marv Albert is saying, well, you know, he, see, some people are comparing him because I, I, I literally wrote down the words as a, a combination of Muhammad Ali and Sugar Ray Leonard. And he has that Magic Johnson and Isaiah Thomas smile. And in less than a minute, he was knocked out on the floor of the ring. <laughs> 
right? His focus was on all this other stuff. There are times, I confess to you, I focus on the things that Satan is doing to try and discourage me. And when I focus on it, my, conf- my compassion for other people lays knocked out on the ring floor. And I read a passage like this and I say, oh Jesus, help me to be more like you. Help me to be more like you. Help me to be like you and not focus on the mistreatment but have eyes of compassion. Jesus ignores the Pharisees' taunts because he sees people. And what does he see of those people? Verse 36, that they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. People who were harassed by cares and doubts and fears. When you're harassed by cares and doubts and fears, you know what? Jesus sees you. They didn't know which way to go. They were sheep without a shepherd. And look at what he says in verse 37. This is the testimony of Jesus. He said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Maybe the disciples are saying, Jesus, don't you see what the Pharisees are saying? And Jesus is saying, oh, do you see how many of my sheep are out there? And soon they're going to be in my pasture. Soon they're going to enter in through my gate and find forgiveness and eternal life. Do you see right now they're so broken and wounded? Oh, but do you understand that there is a plentiful harvest that is going to occur? There are so many out there. Pray that God will raise up those who will tell them. Jesus says, pray that God will raise up common people who have come to know who I am and they go forward with a very uncommon message because they know that what they have can change the lives of people. Hey, what do you say? Well, Jesus says, you have the most meaningful thing to say. And that leads to the third thing, the testimony of the disciples. What they're given to say. We read in chapter 10, because Jesus says, pray that the Lord of the harvest will raise them up. And then he says, and now I'm going to answer that prayer and do it, right? Through you. And we read there about the names of the apostles, The first Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Remember, as we're reading this, that Matthew is an eyewitness. He remembers this occasion. He's lived it. He lists them in pairs, and many commentaries uh, believe that we know Jesus sent them out in pairs, and many believe that that's what Matthew's given us. He's given us the pairs. This is who went out with who. I remember when I was in grade school, uh, right across the street here, and it wasn't a large, you know, it, it, it wasn't public school. It was smaller than a public school class. But, but uh, I, I, as far as I can remember, yeah, every year, I can remember in grade school, certainly up through eighth grade, I, I knew that I was the shortest guy in the class. And most everything we did over there was line up, we're going to pair you off, right? Line up, okay, guys here, girls here. And it was always shortest to tallest, shortest to tallest. I was easy. I, I never. I just walked to the front of the line. Just went to the front of the line. <laughs> yeah, I think it was Rosemary Hannigan. You know, hey, Rosemary. You know, we're we were always going to be together. Not only you know that we were. This was the uh, the pair the, of what they were having us do. Whether it was going into some procession or something, but that was our relationship within the class. We were the shortest, right? That was, just, that was who we were. As we're reading this, we're reading this Matthew, this very personal. These are, 
We all had a personal part of this story. One writer says that they're listed in groups of four, pairs, but in groups of four, the first four had the closest relationships with Jesus, Simon and Andrew and James and John, and then the next four, and of course, saying that the last four were those who, who were not as close to Jesus, and certainly uh, Judas Iscariot. Peter's listed first in all of the Gospels because of his leadership role, and Jesus will designate that later when we get to that in Matthew. But what I love is verse 3, because we read Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector. If you read Mark's version of this, he says Matthew. If you read Luke's version of this, he says Matthew. They don't say the tax collector. They leave that out. But Matthew is saying to me, we all know who we were. We all know that we weren't there because of what we brought to the table. We weren't there because of our fame, because of our fortune, because of our influence. We all knew who we were. And I can tell you who I was. I was a tax collector who was hated by the people because I put a burden on them, often an unfair burden. And Jesus said, I'm going to turn you into someone who goes and shares with them a message of free forgiveness, free salvation. Matthew says, I, I can tell you my part in it. I was this guy, and he said, I'm going to give you something to say. Whew. Wow. Wow. They knew that they were there because it's his kingdom. That's what they have to say. It begins with the Jews. He says, go first to the people of Israel, not to the Gentiles. But in time, what will Jesus do? He will expand their ministry to go to the Gentiles and the entire world. It begins here with what? Verse 7 of chapter 10. And as you go, preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But it's going to expand to what? It's going to expand to the message that includes how the king himself secured that kingdom by his death and his burial and his resurrection. Whew. When we hear his message of salvation and we're changed by it, we have something to say. The Apostle Paul back in Romans chapter 10, right? In Romans chapter 10, and this may be used sometimes at a service where they're, we're commissioning a missionary to go off to some foreign land. Paul's talking to all of us. Whenever the opportunity is there, and I've said it before, and, I, and I, I mean it. If you're at the register at Wawa, and there's 11 people in line, I mean, you're the, the worker. That is not your opportunity with each person as they're paying to say, you want to tell you about the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's not your opportunity. You'll be fired for that, and you should be fired for that, Right? <laughs> Because I want the line to keep moving in front of me, right? Just like any other customer does. But when that opportunity is there, and as you pray for it, oh God, show me, use me, alert me. Paul says, remember this about what you have to say in Romans chapter 10 and verse 11. For the scripture says, whoever believes in Jesus will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Verse 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? It's not talking about a preacher standing in a pulpit. And how will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. That's your feet and my feet. How beautiful 
Why? Because we have something to say. And that message has crossed the world over 2,000 years, and we sit here today in a very different world, and it's fast changing, and things that were part, almost foundational to society are shifting in different ways, but there is something that remains the same. It's the testimony of Jesus back in Matthew chapter 9, that the people are out there, and they are distressed, and they are dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. That hasn't changed. I love the movie The Last Samurai and Katsumoto who is you know the, the head of the samurai he believes there's no more need for the samurai and he says to Algren the emperor could not hear my words they're not listening to us and Algren says to him so you will take your life and Katsumoto says, the way of the samurai is not necessary anymore. And Algren says, necessary? What could be more necessary? He said, look, they're not listening anymore. I'm just going to pack it in. The way they're treating us, I'm going to pack it in. I know where I'm going. Peter says to us in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, they're still out there. And they're dispirited and they're lost. And they're broken hearted and they're like sheep without a shepherd. They're looking for hope. They're looking for truth. They're looking for meaning. And Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Ask the Lord of the harvest, oh God. You don't have to say, Lord, give me something to say. You already have something to say. Lord, show me where to say it. Lord, Help me not to have my eyes on the mistreatment. Help me to have it with compassion on those who are lost. Help me to be dominated by them. And help me to say what you've given me to say. Father in heaven, we thank you that as we're about to share this communion, that it is your life living in us that we can share. We don't have to generate anything. We don't have to create a message. You've given it to us. Pictured in this bread and in this cup. There is one Savior who has already done the work. Forgive us, Lord, for when our eyes are on the mistreatment. And when compassion lays knocked out on the ring floor. Give us the eyes of Jesus. Give us the words to say. In the time of need we pray for your glory. Amen.